June 2019, paper two, uh, Mark Scheme, review of the paper. So question one is a question about uncertainties. It shows you measuring the distance A, distance B and the distance C. Uh, you have uh, a meter ruler with one millimeter divisions taking these measurements and you get these three measurements and the uncertainty that the student has allocated is two mil. Explain why the student's estimated uncertainty in measurement A it's greater than the smallest division on the meter ruler. Well, of course, what you're doing, of course, is you're measuring, uh, taking a reading here and taking a reading here. In each of those two readings, you have an uncertainty down to the uh, resolution of your meter ruler. And so it will be greater than twice, indeed, the uh, uncertainty, the absolute uncertainty in each reading. So uh, the uncertainty in each reading uh, is one millimeter. And so you add these together to get the uncertainty in A. So two marks, two points. The uncertainty in each reading is one millimeter. For one mark you add these together to get the uncertainty in your value for the second mark. Things like the smallest division is one millimeter, uh, hard to see measurements less than one millimeter, um, Ruler slightly misaligned. These things are not enough. Uh, they are uh, just too vague, really. Saying the uncertainty doubles is insufficient. You need to be saying what the uncertainty is and why it doubles. Um, <clears throat> so, there are other permutations there, but uh, that is how I would answer the question. The distance between the centers of spots A and C is the distance between the spots C and E. Uh, A plus B equals C. Calculate the percentage uncertainty in the sums of A and B. So the uncertainty in that sum, of course, is that you add the absolute uncertainties in the two. So the uncertainty is four millimeters. So the percentage uncertainty is four divided by the value, which is five, four, four, which will give you 0.74. So that's how it's done. Um, if you did 2 over 272, that also works. One three then discuss why the experimental measurements lead to a different percentage uncertainty in C compared to that in A and B, or A plus B. Well, there's a couple of ways you can look at that. There are three marking points here and you need two of them. So one thing you can say is the percentage uncertainty in C is less than uh, the percentage uncertainty uh, in A and B. And working that out, 
If you work it out, you get 0.37 or 0.4 if you do it to one sig fig. So there's two of your marking points. The other way you could say it is uh, that C's measurement involves fewer readings than uh, A and B because you're, you've got two for A and two for B, whereas you've only got two in total for C. There's a third marking point, but that would be the way that I would do it. One four then. One other safety measure to minimise the risk of eye damage when using a laser in the lab. There's a, a variety of things you could say here. Um, you could say stand behind the laser. You could say uh, don't look directly at the laser. You could say uh, don't look at specular reflection of the laser. Um, you could, uh, warning signs could be put up. A wide variety of things you could say there. Um, don't keep the lab darkened to reduce the uh, relative intensity of the laser. A lot of things you could say. Any valid answer, but you know things like don't look at the laser. It's not the laser is the problem, it's the laser beam is the problem. Um, don't point the laser anywhere but at the grating. Well, it's a bit vague. You're talking about specifically where you don't point it into your eyes, into somebody else's eyes, at a reflective surface. So uh, the loss of marks here is almost certainly going to be down to a lack of precision in what you say. You know what you should be saying, but you may say it in an imprecise way, uh, ambiguous way, vague way, careless way, and that will cost you the mark. 1.5, experimental arrangement with y, uh, the perpendicular distance between the diffraction grating and the screen, and some data for a, b, and c. Here we go, calculate theta. Well, I would use tan of theta being the distance c over 1.280 uh, and get theta that way giving me a value of 23 degrees. Um, if you make a mistake in the middle here, uh, if that leads you to an error in the fourth sig fig, that will be acceptable. Uh, and there's only one mark here, so they're not too bothered about sig figs. Uh, you can give it to two to six actually and don't rely on that because generally the rule is plus or minus one sig fig is what you allowed if you aren't told to do it to the right number so uh, 23.0 sig figs uh, you have c to three sig figs so i would give my answer to three because that's the four. So um, I've done tan of theta, I can't do symbols here, is uh, 544 divided by 1.280. Sorry, it's 0 0.544 over 1.280 because that is in millimeters and that is in meters. So 0 0.544, giving me 23 degrees. Wavelength of the laser light then in 1.6. 
you're going to use d sine theta equals n lambda. Uh, there's no credit for writing that down, of course, but using it then, uh, of course, d is 1 over this figure, 1 over 3 times 10 to the 5. That'll give you 3.3 times 10 to the minus 6. Sticking in your numbers, you'll get 6.5 or 6.52 times 10 to the power of minus 7 meters. That is your answer. D sine theta equals in lambda gives you that. But of course, you've got to work out D correctly. One over the lines per meter is the meters per line distance between uh, lines. So the student plans to repeat the experiment using the same diffraction grating and laser. So lambda is fixed and D is fixed. One way the student can change the experimental arrangement. Well, if you look at the expression, d sine theta equals n lambda, you want to make d bigger. Because in increasing d, you will decrease the percentage of uncertainty in d. Also, by increasing d, uh, you're going to, uh, sorry, I've increased y. Um, <laughs> let's use the right terminology. If you increase y, then you will in, uh, decrease the percentage of uncertainty in the value of y which in turn will decrease the energy uncertainty uh, in your calculated value of lambda. Uh, and also, uh, if you make D bigger, you'll make C bigger, and therefore you will decrease the percentage uncertainty in C, thereby decreasing the percentage uncertainty in lambda. So increase Y, which decreases the percentage of uncertainty in y and so in lambda. This also increases c. Well, it's a capital C, I think, isn't it? Not that it really matters, not a small case. C. So this also increases c, decreasing the percentage on certain t in c and so in lambda. So there you have it. Or of course you could use a higher order spot rather than using E, use F or G if you can. Uh, we'll find out later that the maximum order is five. So you could go one, two, three, four, five. And of course, by doing that, whilst Y remains the same, C gets a lot bigger. So you could use a higher order spot or uh, you could measure the distance from A to E and then take a, an average, which would reduce your uh, uncertainty in C. So there are things you can do, but uh, by increasing Y, you will decrease the uncertainty, percentage of uncertainty in Y and also then in C. Uh, and that has those dual benefits. Do you remember to talk about percentage uncertainty rather than just uncertainty? Because the uncertainty in Y doesn't change, but the percentage uncertainty does. Likewise, the, the uncertainty in C doesn't change by doing this, but the percentage uncertainty does. So you need to be very clear about that. Question two, then. I can't draw the line of best fit on here because it's just too difficult to do uh, freehand with the computer. But if you put your uh, 
you rule her onto this, you will see there is a straight line up to 8 volts. And then it curves. So you're looking for a straight line through the origin up to 8 and then curving thereafter. The sorts of things you're looking for, sorts of things that I'm looking for, um, I want that straight line up to point 8. I'm looking for a balance of points either side of your line of best fit here. Uh, so they should be, there should be as many above as below and they should be equidistant. So uh, the line should go through the, the crosses. It doesn't have to go through the centre, but it has to touch the cross. Otherwise you're saying that point is anomalous. There should be a continuous transition from that straight line at 8 into the curve. It shouldn't be a straight line and then a sharp change to a curve. It is a smooth transition from one to the other. This is part of the skill of drawing your line of best fit. So you should have a curve of decreasing gradient. Uh, the line should be thin. The thickness should not vary. It shouldn't be hairy, you know, there shouldn't be sort of sketching going on. And there shouldn't be, you know, wobbles or kinks in it. Now, if any one of those points is failed, you'll still get the mark. If you feel more than one of those points, then you will not get the mark. So take your time, review the points. Well, Go back in the video, review those points and check that you're clear on those being the requirements. It's only one mark, but it's a skill and you need to have it. 2.2 two, then, identify the data point with the greatest value of current and voltage at which R obeys Ohm's law. Well, that is the very top of your straight line section, of course. So that is the point at 8 and 360 times 10 to the minus 3 here. So reading off your graph. Then when R obeys Ohm's law, it has a resistance of 22.2 ohms. Determine the percentage increase in the resistance of R from its 22.2 ohm value to its value when the current is 550 times 10 to the minus 3 amps. So we're looking to find out the value of the resistance at 550. So we come across to wherever your curve is, come down to whatever the PD uh, that shows is and work out the resistance. We're not looking for a rate of change here. This is not like, for example, a velocity time graph, which is a curve and you're looking for the acceleration at a point. We're not looking for the rate of change. We're just looking to work out the value of R when the current is, whatever I said, uh, <laughs> I've lost it now. A 550 milliamps. So read across from 550 to where your line uh, crosses that line. Come down, read off the potential difference at that. Calculate your resistance. So your value of V, I don't have uh, my line of best fit, so I can't read that off. But your value of V divided by 0.55 amps gives you the resistance. Minus 22.2 gives you the difference between the two, gives you the increase. If you divide that then by 22.2, you will get the fractional increase and then multiply that by 100 to get your percentage increase. So there it is. So uh, a lot of candidates, when they did this paper, worked out the gradient of the tangent. That's a mistake. 
because you're not looking for the rate of change. Very often you do have to work out the gradient of the tangent because you are looking for a rate of change. Here you're just looking for the value at that current. So this is what you do. And an answer to two or three sig figs. So whatever your value of V is, I obviously can't tell, but that's how you do it. The value of V, you read off the graph from your line of best fit at that current, work out the resistance, work out the difference in resistance, the increase, divide by the original value to get the proportional increase, and then times 100 to get the percentage increase. Two, four, one of the circuits A to D shown was used to obtain the current voltage data in figure three. The maximum resistance of P is twice the resistance of R. The battery is an EMF of 14.6 and negligible internal resistance. So one of these four circuits is right, the others are wrong. We need to proceed really carefully. So, in circuit A, well, the first thing that I notice here is the current is the current through P, not through R, because this current will flow this way. Clearly, some of it will flow this way. But this is not the current through R. This is the current through P and R. So circuit A is wrong because it's the wrong current. Circuit B, well, you need, this is measuring the current through R, so that's good. And we're measuring the PD across R, so that's good. Is there anything else wrong with this? Well, We will get an incomplete voltage range here. We can't get the full, if we look at our range here, zero to 14 volts. 14.6. We can't do that. So B is wrong. C then. Well, the voltmeter isn't in parallel with R. It's in series. So that's going to be wrong. So I haven't ruled out the first three. It has to be this one. So let's check it. So here we have the PD across R. That's good. Here we have the current through R, that's good. And here you can see that if you take it down here, you're going to get basically no PD across R. If you go all the way up here, you'll get all of the supply PD across R. So that works. So. It is D. These questions you've really got to proceed carefully with. You've got to check them one by one. You're likely, with a cursory glance, to think, well, there's more than one that works here. You've got to look closely. So that's the answer to that. Going through one by one. A is wrong because, B is wrong because, C is wrong because, so D is right. One mark for saying D, three marks for ruling out the other three. Question three then. Explain how the change in quark character in the beta plus decay affects the number of neutrons. Well, Beta plus is a proton decaying into a neutron. So there's one mark. What else can I say? 
So I have a gain of one neutron and a loss of one proton. That's one mark. What else can I say? Well, I think I would have to go on to talk about why that happens. What is, what is changing to cause this uh, change of character? So this is uh, an up quark changing to a down quark. There's your second mark. Or you could just say you go from up, up, down to up, down, down. So those are your two marks. The state, the, how the number of neutrons and protons changes, and the explain, why does that happen? It's that change of quark flavour. So specifically the, the change in quark flavour. 3, 2 then, calculate the momentum of uh, one of the gamma photons producing this annihilation. The energy of each gamma photon, 0.52 MeV. So you're going to convert your MeV into EV. So you're going to get 5.2 times 10 to the 5. EV. There's my first step. Then convert that into joules. And then use uh, P equals E over C to get me my momentum. Uh, 2.77 or 2.8 times 10 to the minus 22. Newton seconds. Three, three. Positron and electron meet and annihilate at position X. And you have a gamma photon triggered at P or triggering the detector at P. Where would the other one be? Directly opposite. So one either side will do, you'd expect it to be here, any one of these three, but only one. If you do more than one, you will lose the mark. So that would be the one, one either side, just to allow for a bit of uh, squiffy perspective on that, but that's the one. Why is that the case? Well, it is the case because momentum is conserved. There was zero momentum before, so uh, the momentum of each photon must be equal and opposite for that to be the case. So move off in opposite directions. Three, five, figure six shows a stream of photons of light emitted from the sun incident on a solar seal. A solar seal is an experimental spacecraft that uses photons of light to accelerate it. Figure seven shows the velocity time graph of the solar seal Calculate the acceleration. Well, that is the gradient of that graph. So work out the gradient. Um, so you've got 79, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79, 79 and a half over 1.2. 4.5, 10 to the minus 6. For example, 
giving us 4.5, 4.51. Okay, anywhere between 4.40 and 4.65 times 10 to the minus 6 is acceptable there. The reflectance of a surface is proportional to the percentage of incident photons that are reflected. If you increase the reflectance, then you increase the percentage of incident photons being reflected. What effect will that have on the acceleration? It will increase the acceleration for one mark. Why? Because there's a greater rate of change of momentum, more of those photons are being reflected, so more of them are going from going forwards to going backwards, which gives you a larger force. So, increase greater rate of change of momentum. So, good force, resultant force. So, that's three, six. Question four. We have a boat in a trailer being pulled up by a motor connected to a 24 volt battery of negligible internal resistance. So, the the power is not being affected by the current being supplied. Motor twist on at time t equal to zero. And this is the current time in milliseconds graph. Determine the total energy input by the 24 volt battery to the motor in the first 200 milliseconds. So up to here. So we have current times time. or the rate of change of current. What can we do with the graph? We can read values off, which isn't going to give us energy. We can work out the gradient of the graph, rate of change of current. Doesn't really help us. I don't see how that helps us. But the area under the graph, current times time, would give us charge. So how does that help us? Well, we also know the PD, and we know the energy would be the charge times the PD, each of those charges is being moved through 24 joules per coulomb. So if we work out the area under the graph to 200 milliseconds, that we do by counting squares. I am not going to do this, of course. So do that and you get 240 joules. Or you could have attempted to work out the average current over that 200 milliseconds and then uh, use ITV. You'll end up with the same thing. I think the easier thing to do is probably to, to calculate the area under the graph. 240 joules is the answer. The boat and trailer are initially at rest. In the first 200 milliseconds, the boat and trailer are raised through a vertical height of 3.3 10 to the minus 2 meters, and the speed increases to 0.85 meters per second. Assume all the useful energy has been transferred into Ke and GPE. There's the mass. What's the average efficiency? Well, the efficiency, of course, uh, is the useful energy input over the or useful energy output of the total energy input. And the useful is the Ke plus the GPE.
divided by the total energy input. Well, we've already worked that out up here, remember? Total energy input, 240 joules. So your Ke, if you work that out, half mv squared, there's your v, there's your m, half mv squared gets you 65 joules. MGH gets you 58, 58.3. And then you divide that by a 240. And that will give you 0.51 or 51%. Now, of course, if you've made a mistake in 4.1, if you've got the wrong energy, then that error carried forward as long as it wasn't from an error of physics because error of physics doesn't get error carried forward. But if this figure is wrong, but your working is right, and you know what you've done here is just careless, you've forgotten a bit, you know, rather than perhaps working out the gradient of the graph and saying that was the energy. That's an error of physics. That'll get you nothing of those three and it'll also cost you all of those three. So do take care with that. So uh, four, three, then either of the circuits could be used to reduce the initial current surge. Why would uh, the thermistor be better? So the thermistor, the resistance changes dramatically, exponentially with temperature and the temperature will rise because of the current flowing through it. So as the current rises, the temperature rises, the resistance falls. Conversely, when the current is low, the resistance is high because the temperature is low. So initially, the current will be smaller because the thermistor will be colder and so the resistance will be higher. Which is what you want. You want to uh, deal with that initial surge. So there's your answer. 